So we, we go from um, uh, spandex ballet, I think, in a way. Um, uh, next up is uh, Martin King, uh, also uh, not unfamiliar to those of you who are not attending this event for the first time. And he's going to talk to us about the revolution. And we're actually going from no slides at the beginning to, is it 101? Yeah, so it's going to be a bit <laughs> of a whirlwind. So enjoy. OK. Um, I'm here, of course, to talk about technology and education. But what it's, I really want to talk about is sex and drugs and rock and roll, because that's the reason a lot of people go to college, I suppose, in the first place. Um, I want to tell a few stories before I get on to the sex and the drugs and the rock and roll. Um, one of our students, Riyadh, you say, well, what's special about him, for example? Um, it turns out that, oh, the click of more technical folks. It turns out that uh, Riyadh, there's something wrong there. Riyadh is quadriplegic and he can't move from the neck down and he can't talk. And that screenshot there is from uh, a technology experiment we were doing with some eye tracking software so that he could look at the screen and he could type out the letters on the screen and the words and then speak with those. Um, more technical thoughts here, hang on a second. Ah, there we go. Um, excuse me. All right. Okay, there's a screenshot of some of Riyadh's activities um, using Google, for example, there. He, from home, he's using Google Plus to interact with his colleagues. He's done a video. There's a bit there of some Google chat with me. Um, if I go back a bit, no, okay. All right, okay, this, this slide left intentionally blank. Um, it's a bit sensitive because we've got a student that's got severe learning problems. He's been abused at home and he was put into care. And I asked him, how does he catch up with all his work that we give him online? Because the PC that he's got in his care home is not connected to the internet. And the student could hardly talk, but then he pulls out his smartphone and then starts to be quite articulate, talking about, here's my Facebook, here's my music, here's my Google+, Plus, here's my Google Docs. This is the stuff my teacher was telling me to use. And the same sort of thing applies if you're on the street. You can hardly carry around a desktop with you, not even a laptop. But you could carry about a mobile phone or, or, or one like Lindsay is uh, using today, uh, a more basic cell phone. But connectivity is quite important, um, especially in this day and age, especially if you ever get a laptop, a, a, a tablet, and give it to an old age pensioner. They don't seem to have any problem with it. I remember giving one to uh, one of my... Uh, relatives and showing them Mount Kenya and they just scrolled it with their, their fingers. Now, the, I remember seeing uh, way back trying to show a, uh, an Ethiopian refugee how to use a mouse and he was trying to you know, lift it up and down like this. He didn't have the concept of moving it on the screen. It was a completely different experience. So again, maybe our elderly people are post-PC natives and indeed silver surfers are you know, a growing trend on the web. And they're becoming, like they did in the past, they're becoming quite important to our, our learning. So here's you know, one uh, Sugra Mitra's experiments of English grannies helping kids in India learn English. And of course, these are the post-PC natives that we normally think of. This wave of young people that go and come through our education system, they haven't picked up a keyboard necessarily. They pick up a, a tablet or a smartphone first. And of course, to a bit of a pun of a post-PC native, but you know, if you're in Africa, you may be lucky and have missed the last 25 years, and you can come straight on with a new generation of equipment. And this is a slide from a UNESCO report of an African herdsman checking the price of cattle in different markets and deciding from that which one he's going to drive his cattle to, kind of empowering him, giving him some power against you know, the like the institutions. So what am I trying to say? Oops. Well, I'm trying to say that at the moment, only a third of the world is connected. Just imagine what a world wide web would be. So you've got companies like Google, of course, they see you know, new opportunities, saturated market, but they've got a developing world that's there for the taking. Facebook jumping on that bandwagon as well trying to connect up those parts of the world that are not connected already. Uh, and you've got state initiatives, you've got some in Britain, you've got this one in Chicago, uh, a cost of 
million dollars to connect up 30 low-income households. And of course, technology can have great benefit for the disabled. It's hardly ever mentioned, but that's probably where the greatest positive advantage is. You know, for us here, you know, technology can have an impact, but if you're like Riyadh, you can't speak, you can't move, technology can have an en enormous impact on your life. So one of the anticipations is that by 2020, we may have three billion new minds online, mostly from those that aren't connected at the moment. Developing nations, the disadvantaged, the disabled, and the currently disconnected. And one interesting notion of that is that a lot of these are going to be in Africa. It's going to be the, the, the big rising period um, for this part of the century, Africa getting online. So what's... Oh, technical for Anyway, what's happening? Web squared. I don't know if anybody come across this concept, web squared. Nobody. It's uh, Tim O'Reilly. Oh, OK, you come back. I'm going forward. Uh, technical problems with my clicker. Next slide. There we go. OK. Web squared. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, the guy at the top there, he came up with the, the phrase Web 2. But when he was thinking about the era we're in at the moment, he thought Web 3 just doesn't describe it because the combination of social, mobile, sensory is creating a combinatorial, exponential kind of effect. And you combine that with the Web 2 era, and you get Web squared. Something is moving very, very fast. Right. Uh, Moore's law comes into effect here. Um, from mainframes down to desktops, down to laptops, handheld computing, wearable computing. Once it gets, anything gets digital, it suffers, if you like, power laws of exponential change that allow the disadvantaged, the disconnected, the, the, the disabled to get online when they didn't do before. Uh, we're all online, but maybe we're the privileged few. So the World Wide Web is coming. And what does this mean? Well, it means here comes everybody, but we're not all the same. I mean, again, I was looking at this room. We're not that different, are we, the people in this room? But there are a lot of different people coming onto the internet. One thing I was looking at recently was um, culture. You could define culture as the circulation of meaning in a community. And typically, to circulate meaning, you've got to be able to, like Lindsay, maybe have face-to-face, -face, talk with them, maybe send them a note. So geography has often been a defining factor in how culture develops, before the internet, before mobile communications and uh, the phone, for sure. If you show this video, I've only got a still of it, though, but if you show this video to different cultures, they often describe it in different ways. An American would often describe it as hey, look at the big fish in the middle. Uh, look at that fish blowing bubbles. But if you show it to other cultures, they'd often show, uh, talk about the green background, the plants. They'd emphasise commonality, whereas Westerners would often emphasise difference. Some cultures, like uh, the Ubuntu philosophy in Africa, you know, there's a story where an anthropologist put a reward for a set of kids. American kids would run after it, trip each other up, fight over it, whereas the African kids would often all hold hands and run to it together. It's a different kind of approach. Um, people in Kenya, for example, value the multiple intelligence that we all know about differently and more equally than we do in the West, where we generally tend to emphasise analytical, reductionist type of thought. There's one example from a 70s comedy where this kid comes home from school and he says, I, I walked out of the exam, I didn't like the questions they asked. Um, what word do you associate with cup? And he said, table. We don't have any saucers in our house, we're so poor. I said, table. He said, you've got the wrong answer. It should be saucer. So he walked out, didn't like it. If you try to avoid verbal reasoning and go for non-verbal reasoning, it's just as bad. Westerners like matrices, they like classification, but if you're from Africa, you don't think that way. This is a, a completely different type of intent. But the trouble is, for, for decades, that had been used to classify people into our education system. You fail that, you're deemed to be 
and intelligent. So why is this important? Well, this is where the sex comes in. We all know the problem of inbreeding. If you, <laughs> no, if you, if you just keep, you know, doing the same thing, you emphasise often the same kind of faults. It's sometimes good for a racehorse, but it's no use for other things. You know, it becomes very, very sort of blinkered. So it's a, the argument I'm putting here is the argument for biodiversity, diversity as a survival mechanism for the future and its, its value, rather than the monocultures that education typically fosters. Oops, OK. Um, this slide here is that you know, the outliers, the differences are very important. It's quite good in this room. There are lots of different um, opinions in this room. And these are important in order to bring new ideas into debate. Click. Ah, there we go. OK. Um, you might have come across this idea of the strength of weak ties. Um, it isn't the people in your community necessarily that matter the most because they've all got the same ideas. We tend to do that on social media, on Twitter. You know, we follow people with like-minded ideas. But the most powerful thing to do is probably follow people with opposing views, if you can, or slightly different views. There's one idea of the hand axe. Why did it take the hand axe two million years to evolve? It didn't necessarily take that long to evolve. It could have evolved into different social groups, but if they died out, it never spread. It was the spread of ideas between different social groups, between different cultures, which is quite, quite important. Um, so evolution, it depends on sex. It's all about diversity and connection. It's difficult to have sex with yourself. Leonardo, well, not impossible, I suppose, but <laughs> for some of us anyway. Uh, but um, Leonardo was a prime example, polymath, having sex with himself, if you like. He embraced different different traditions, different disciplines, to be the genius that he was back in the day. But today, with our kind of wicked world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, things are so complex, and you can't always do it by yourself. You often have to have connections with other people. Renaissance too is about Renaissance people rather than Renaissance person. So things are going to get messy. For example, if you put a physicist, or in this case a cosmologist, with a doctor, medicine researchers, you get a new approach to cancer. Or if you put material scientists with biologists, you can get new materials. And of course, these days, uh, maybe Lindsay would disagree, but anyone almost can play guitar. You just have to listen to them. And this is one of the things I like doing, um, looking at other people on YouTube playing stuff. For example, this, this guitar solo from Steve Vai. Um, just hundreds and hundreds, of, I, haven't, oh, I haven't got the number there, but oh, 31,000 results of people in their bedrooms picking up a guitar. This guitar solo is quite awesome. Uh, I like this guy, he's even doing the, the hair bit that Steve Vai does while he plays, and he, he does his hair while he's playing his guitar. But um, this is quite common everywhere. I don't know if you could learn what Lindsay was playing on her piano at home. It's quite possible, I reckon. Um, and of course, the obvious example of crowdsourcing anybody playing guitar is anybody here could contribute to Wikipedia. Couldn't do that in the Encyclopedia Britannia, could you? I put Wikipedia up there in, in, in uh, emphasis because I always forget about it. It's, it's in your face, that sort of stuff that you take for granted and never think of. But there it is, and the usual suspects down the side, YouTube, etc. Um, so today, mobile technologies do empower you. For example, what I'm talking about now, you're all you know, commenting on it. I'll have a look at that later. Um, nothing goes unnoticed these days, in a sense. Um, and what you say, phone a friend, you can check out with somebody else what is that guy talking about? Is he talking a load of rubbish? I have no idea. Let me call up somebody. Anyone can play guitar. You've got loads of stories. I've just got a few here, like uh, this 14-year-old invented a new test for cancer. Or this 19-year-old has found a way to clean up the junk floating around in the Earth's oceans. Google every year have a Google Science Fair for young people. A new anti-flu medicine from a 17-year-old etc. These Ethiopian kids, um, 
you might know this Negra Ponte, the one laptop per child recent initiative, you know, airdrop these um, iPads into Ethiopian village. They've got software on them, they've been disabled, the camera's been disabled by MIT engineers, but the kids worked out how to enable the camera all by themselves. They didn't have to go to school. In fact, they opened the boxes, learned how to use the iPads all by themselves. As did these kids in Sugar Mitra's initial uh, early experiments, hole in the wall, self-organized learning environment, stick a computer like a you know, hole in the wall machine, just let them at it, and they learned how to use it all by themselves. Didn't go to school. Or Kelvin Doe, reverse engineered a uh, amplifier and a radio and made his own stuff from the rubbish he found. Or, I have trouble pronouncing this, William Kamkwamba, I'm not sure if I got that right, but um, he couldn't continue school because his family were too poor. So he went to the library, not the internet in this case, but he went to the library, worked out how to make a windmill, how to pump water with it, and how to generate electricity. And then he started building this for his village and for other people. You have African students inventing groundbreaking malaria, anti-malaria drug. Africa and their youth are really desperate for this type of connectivity, the new minds that are coming online. It's a great opportunity for them. So where am I trying to go with this? Well, what I'm trying to say is that we're no longer the center of our own universe. You know, we're just out there somewhere. It's a much bigger world coming online now. It's a world that's now too big to know. You can't really be like Leonardo anymore. You do have to work with others. It's a flatter world and you need new skills. You know, that what got you here won't get you there type of idea. So if you come across the long tail, you know, traditionally education, information has been constrained and you get elitist education system. If you look at the area of the curve, this part of the curve would probably equal that part of the curve. You can get as much stuff from the tail of that curve in terms of information, knowledge perhaps, as you can from a few elite people. Uh, traditionally, you know, we've relied education as a kind of hierarchy to generate elite people, but there, maybe by connectivity we can generate a crowdsourced education system. So it's sex and drugs and rock and roll. I've got to get something in from Frank Zappa. Your, your mind does work better when it's open. But education, you know, does, often doesn't work when it's open. It likes to put up all sorts of barriers. You know, you can pass or fail, we'll let you know. Uh, you can use our uh, colouring set. And we'll stop using Facebook and Twitter and mobile phones, stuff we don't like. It's a bit like a Rapunzel tower. Bring people in for their own protection from that nasty world outside. And we'll, you know give you the things that we think you should know. Um, but whose agenda is that? It's a bit like education is using a colouring set, paint by numbers, instead of paint your own stuff. It's a bit more like X Factor, that ain't rock and roll. And, oh, I'm already out of time. Now. And um, the drugs part, you know, education generating more of a kind of dependency culture. You know, rather than equipping you to go outside and do your own stuff, yeah, come into education and we'll give you the tools. We'll give you everything you need to know. Uh, education is a bit like a game of levels, you know, an elitist hierarchical thing. But that linear progression may be breaking for a more networked organisation. Uh, this 12-year-old in Pakistan can study degree level stuff, just like I did when I was young and I used to be ill a lot. I used to watch the Open University, all that degree stuff on the black and white telly in the day. So education, yeah, it can be spoon-fed. Maybe it's time to get messy. You can give a man or give a person a fish, feed him for a day, of course, teach him how to fish. He can, he can feed himself for life. Like these African villagers, you can phone up, find out the market prices, the weather, different techniques. Click. All right, uh, and there's no better example, I don't think, than the rock band for education. A group of people get together, make stuff, work together to make stuff. They're not necessarily taught. 
I don't know if the Rolling Stones were taught how to play guitars and drums, but they probably taught themselves. Three Edge of Punk's never been more relevant. It's probably now is a good time to rethink how people learn, maybe towards inquiry-based learning, maker project-based learning. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens when technology mediates culture. Basically, you get network effects. One phone on its own is no use. Two phones, no, is OK. The more phones you have, the greater the effect, the greater the change, and the faster the change it can be. Um, these guys did appreciate exponential effects. Einstein said that compound interest was the most powerful force in the universe. And Kurt, uh, Ray Kurzweil there is uh, talking about the singularity when, I missed that one out, when things get so fast that they change and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You can't predict it. The world becomes volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And we need people to be able to accommodate that. Technology is kind of reinforcing this exponential change upon us where a tweet that you make in this room could affect God knows what elsewhere in the connected world, the butterfly effect. So, uh, Foti, all I've got a few questions. What will the future of us be like? Will we all become kind of homogenous, westernised? Maybe we'll all become Americans. Or will we be fragmented and difference and diversity will continue? Will education escape the zombie apocalypse? Kind of inbred, X-factor type of irrelevant thing. Can education be part of the revolution at all? Or would we prefer just to block it out? And what is a revolution anyway? Uh, there is one warning about this. Um, if it is about sex, I read this on the Metro. Um, do be careful and maybe pace it a little bit, unlike these poor mice that I was reading about, that um, they save all their sex up for one big event at the end and uh, they, they die through it. Uh, so there is one um, video just at the end to finish with, um, Riyadh's words. Whoops. Have you got it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Good morning, everyone. This is practice. That's amazing, Ria. That's very old. So we gave him a voice. He has a voice now in our connected world. All right, that's it. Thanks, Shrek. Right. <laughs>